Kira Koto. Now my Haremai. Teve Tola. Sorry for my shit finish. <laughs> Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's Oasis Lunchtime Talk. On behalf of the Games Research Lab, I would like to introduce our guest speaker, Dr. Lawrence May. He's a lecturer at the University of Auckland in the Faculty of Education. Auckland is located in Aotearoa, New Zealand, my home country, so I'm especially proud to be able to welcome a person from my country here, just to prove that there's more than one of us. <laughs> uh, he's currently a visiting scholar at the Centre of Excellence in Game Culture Studies at Tampere University. Larry's work examines emergent play, ecology and apocalypse in video games. His book, Digital Zombies, Undead Stories, Narrative Emergence in Video Games, was published by Bloomsbury in 2021. It's a great book. I've read it twice. Um, today, he'll be speaking to the topic, Ephemeral Ecologies, Player Paratexts at the End of the World. Larry will be speaking for approximately 40 to 45 minutes. And the remainder of the hour we will be devoted to questions from the audience. So if you do have a question for Larry, just wait until then to ask that question. Uh, Larry, thank you very much. The floor is yours. Welcome. Thank you, Tom. Yeah, normally I start by saying, hi, I'm Larry. I'm from New Zealand, but Tom has done all the hard work on that. So we can probably uh, get straight in. But kia ora koutou katoa. It is... Um, an absolute pleasure to be back in Tampere for the third time, to be hosted by the centre, to be invited to talk um, and to hang out with all the people I've met in the past day already. Um, so we'll just crack straight into it. I've titled my talk Ephemeral Ecologies and that's because the project I'm reporting from hopes to illuminate a few things, right? So the first thing is the ways that emergent and ephemeral ecological dynamics are generated by players through contemporary games. Uh, the second is that user-created paratexts are a kind of ephemera that bear quite important ecological qualities. And the third, uh, and I've said this one's ironic, it's a kind of ironic inversion uh, that ecologies in the real world and in video games are not ephemeral to one another. Rather, they're quite closely, quite tangibly uh, entangled. So that's the headline and hopefully we tick off all three things by the end. Um, I think we're all familiar with the dire state of our planet amidst uh, human-induced ecological crises. I probably don't need to bang on about this too much, but our extinction beckons thanks to human hubris and industrial capitalism's sort of voracious appetite for fossil fuels, for accumulation, for waste, for toxicity. Uh, and during the Anthropocene, which is a contested term but a useful shorthand for this kind of era where humanity has seeked dominion over the planet, uh, we've, as you know, We've ravaged environments, climate systems, and our ecosystems, right? It's not a, it's not a particularly pleasant picture. And as the uh, planetary assault of the Anthropocene has worn on, eco-critical analysis within game studies has expanded significantly. Uh, and I'm sort of shortcutting, spending too much time with the literature by saying, here are the people who have helped me to the point where I am today, organized in some loose piles. Um, and this is not a complete picture at all. Um, Eco-critical game studies has particularly benefited, I think, from some foundational models. Ben Abraham and Dashana J. Manns, uh, they, uh, they've offered a typology that you might be familiar with that helps explain environmental dynamics within games. It positions environments as uh, backdrop, uh, antagonist, text or resource, and then Alinda Chang in Playing Nature uh, has given us a really wonderful comprehensive account of the way that um, virtual environments and our lived worlds bleed into one another. Uh, and the, the cool thing about these is these frameworks not only serve to explain sort of plainly ecocentric or ecology focused games, but they can also help us um, illustrate conditions, traditions, of ecological engagement in texts that are like less obviously engaged with ecological concerns on the surface. Uh, 
And given that games offer players rich opportunities to experiment meaningfully with present material, social and political conditions, as well as futures, it's completely unsurprising that their entanglement with ecologies is of interest to scholars, right? And Robbie Fordyce is probably one of my favourite people writing on that. So, let's get to the guts of it. In common with sort of earlier eco-critical work, especially by Ben Abraham, uh, Matosh Falshark, uh, my discussion of ecologies is framed by the work of philosopher Timothy Morton, uh, including his expansive notion of the ecological thought, which you might have encountered already. Uh, Morton emphasizes that ecological thought does not attend solely to nature, uh, but it extends to encompass every aspect of our existence. Uh, so this awareness of the interconnection and interdependence of all forms of life is captured by Morton with this metaphor of a vast sprawling mesh of interconnection without a definitive edge or border. Um, so the mesh reminds us that nature is not a separate entity from humanity, but rather a complex web of relationships uh, with no hierarchy built in. And once we engage more and more with such ecological thinking, uh, the more our world opens up, because it becomes, as the quote says, uh, strangely or frighteningly easy to join the dots and witness the entanglement of all these different life worlds. So, Morton's mode of ecological thinking demands a radical decentering of the human agency that is so prized during the, the Anthropocene, right? And it requires us to see and think in assemblages. Our species anthropocentric mania, that's the term Morton uses, is dramatically interrupted by our reconfiguration as phenomenological beings who are sort of permeated and constituted by other ecological actors. And our agency, as sort of Nathan Snazer argues, uh, uh, ends up um, sort of arriving by virtue of our bodies' functions as sites of relay for all those things that surround us, whether they're other actors in the ecological system, cultures, economies, ecosystems, right? We all just sort of sit in this big assemblage and this radical interconnectedness implies that our actions reverberate through the entire ecological system but the ecological system also reverberates back through us i think that's the the headline so ultimately i seek to trace expressions of what ben abraham has described as an ecological thought for games uh, it's an application of morton's concept in which ecological thought comes to be expressed through the nature of relationships between players and elements of the games. Pretty straightforward, right? Um, but one complication that emerges when we begin thinking in ecological ways is that addressing a game text as a discrete object quickly appears inadequate. Uh, Abraham observes that thinking ecologically challenges our very notion of the boundaries of the play experience, and that while analysis of the eco-critical characteristics of a game is possible, often the actual ecological engagement of play exceeds this partial analysis. So in response to this challenge, I have turned to paratexts created and shared by players in online communities in order to sort of analytically expand the boundaries of the game text or the game experience. Uh, paratexts, I'm sure I don't need to tell the room, but just in case, in the context of game studies include user-generated uh, message board posts, gameplay videos, screenshots, fan art, roleplay stories, uh, player diaries, and so on, right? I'm sure we've all encountered at least one of these. Uh, and paratexts, I'm hoping to show, help reveal the ecological characteristics of emergent experiences of gameplay. Paratexts allow what Suvik Mukherjee calls the disappearing game narrative of an emergent, ever-changing, and ephemeral gameplay experience to be captured and recorded. Uh, importantly, paratexts, as this little list of people have explained at different points, also blur the boundary between themselves, the player, and the video game, offering players opportunities to negotiate and contribute to sort of collective emergent textual meanings that arise from games. So, finally something concrete. Um, 
In this project, I'm turning my attention to a number of mainstream, popular, contemporary video games, right? And I'm trying to use player paratext to illustrate the emergent ecological properties of player experiences. So for this talk, I've just plucked three examples from the wider project, but we could talk more about others at the end if we wanted. Uh, and so I'll discuss Battlefield 2042, Animal Crossing New Horizons, and City Skylines, which I suspect you're all familiar with in this city. Um, and I do just want to pause to acknowledge a man by the name of Ben Hall, who's a doctoral student of mine, who's sort of been working at the coalface, doing the dirty work of actually uh, getting all the paratext, going on Reddit every day. Uh, he gets paid for it though, it's not, it's not exploitative. <laughs> yeah. Good I added that. Um, so it's sort of informed by a series of interrelated digital or virtual ethnographic approaches and by some specific methods for gathering uh, player paratexts from online communities that I've outlined in the book that Tom helpfully plugged earlier. Uh, we've systematically gathered, coded and analysed uh, paratexts from three research sites associated with each of these games. The research sites were the three largest publicly accessible English language online forums associated with each game and just for full transparency here they are and if you're familiar with any of these games these are probably kind of what you expect to see up on the screen right now I hope. Um, so using a combination of targeted keyword searches and sorting these forums by popularity we've kind of we Ben has located relevant artifacts captured them within a database and then we use a combination of um, Abraham and Jay Man's model for environment player relations that I described earlier we sort of fuse it with uh, Morton's key ideas and we've kind of got ourselves like a working framework for identifying which artifacts are of interest to us and doing some initial coding. And so we repeatedly sort of analyze, code, get some key themes, right? It's sort of pretty straightforward. So artifacts within each theme that were like particularly noteworthy or exemplary were then highlighted and sort of taken for further analysis by us. And the totals for each case study game are listed here. So we had 81. 169, 183, um, and these sort of form the basis of my discussion, but we obviously don't have time to talk about 350 uh, player paratech. You're like, thank God, he's not gonna talk about 350. Um, so I'm gonna sort of represent the data in aggregate, or I'll rest on one or two examples along the way. And hopefully that's okay. Um, mm. And the other thing, is for each game we also ended up with like three or four key themes emerging. We do not have time today to talk about 12 themes across 350 artifacts. So I'm just going to give us like a greatest hits package that hopefully joins the dots across the games and gives us a little picture of what's happening in these communities. But you can always ask lots of questions at the end if you think there's something interesting that I really should have uh, covered and didn't. So Battlefield 2042. It's a multiplayer shooter game, if you didn't know, and it's set in the year 2042. Uh, it's a year devastated by a decade of extreme climate change. Uh, the game is sort of based around a scenario where global powers have collapsed. There are resource shortages. There are millions upon millions of climate refugees. Uh, In-game landscapes depict this ravaged and dying and decaying planet uh, and disastrous weather events interrupt play. Um, and so the four key themes that our paratexts sort of arrange themselves around uh, we've called resonance. This was where players sort of recognize and affirm the game's imagined future. Amplification. This is where we saw players sort of asking for more ecology, more interconnection. Dissonance. And this is a dissatisfaction with sort of how those climate imaginaries were articulated in the game. And then ab abjection, where players seem to reject ecological thought. And I'm going to talk about the first and the last, and you can kind of <laughs> colour in the middle yourselves. So, resonance. This is where players recognise and affirm these chains of ecological cause and effects that lead from our present era to the fiction of the game, right? So, we see users, uh, for example, praising 
the direct relationship that the game seems to bear between contemporary reality uh, and its, its, its fiction. Well, we see excitement about the prospect of encountering extreme climatic events from our lived world with users like hoping to encounter floods, forest fires, hurricanes, blizzards, so on and so forth. Um, and this resonance, hopefully you can read that up at the back, it's like the price you pay for the comfortable seat maybe. Um, the resonance with ecological thought continues as players uh, start to recognise specific ecological relationships that are driving the game's uh, apocalypse. So here in this example, contrasting the game's representation of Indian and Singaporean settings, uh, one player points out that the game actually illustrates the inequity of strategies for global adaptation to climate change, forecasting the kind of disproportionate devastation of the climate crisis upon developing countries. Um, further resonance is found in a view like this, that there is like an affective or emotional salience to the game's climate apocalypse tinged atmosphere. So this player identifies that they feel an emotional distance when playing first person shooters that are set in historical conflicts, uh, but they suggest that Battlefield 2042 forces emotional engagement through the horror and urgency of its connection to contemporary life. So we find players orienting themselves toward ecological thought and with the reality, as David Collins tell us, tells us, that along with the, pi uh, the polar ice shelves, climate change is melting the narrative in which we participate as humans. And maybe these players, we could say, are affirming or recognizing that we're already living in the ruins of the future, right? So now I'll jump ahead to the final theme for this game, uh, which speaks to what we're calling the abjection uh, of player experiences, where players appear to reject at times aggressively, as you will see, uh, the climate conscious conceit that underlies this game. And to those familiar, perhaps, with the game's rocky reception by players and critics, these ecological or rather anti ecological reactions uh, may appear entirely predictable, right? The game was not popular with its base when it was released, and we'll get into that a little bit more. So some discussions among users in our data set center upon the question of precisely what future the game represents, with players like dismayed at the lack of technological innovation and progress evident in the game's weapons and equipment and sort of military infrastructure. And these posts typically culminate in a concern that the developers have focused too closely on its climate fiction at the expense of the fidelity of the military simulation that for many players has come to define this series to date. Elsewhere, I quite like this one, users criticize the perceived realism of the game's ecological horrors. So here, this player kind of rallies against um, developer Dice's apparent attempts at brainwashing the game's audiences with what they consider to be over-the-top and cartoonish representations of cataclysmic climate conditions, and unsure whether DICE are like engaged in an act of elaborate satire or are earnest in their attention to the climate crisis, the author and several people who reply to this post uh, nonetheless express anger at the game having an underlying political agenda, right? How dare they? Uh, and yet more paratexts pick up this theme, uh, alleging that Battlefield 2042 has invited politics into the realm of video game play. So here a user, uh, uh, no one can read that that is in bold and italics the word dies, uh, they declare that the art of a video game dies when real life politics are introduced to play. Uh, instead, they say developers should focus on visual and oral quality and above all the experience of fun and leave players unburdened by uh, political expression. I'm sure there are some views in the room about that. Um, so sort of offering a heady blend of vituperation and dismay, these paratexts articulate a state of revulsed abjection generated by encounters with ecological dynamics. And at first glance, these paratexts of abjection might seem 
just sort of simply to remind us, as Tom, who was sitting in the doorway of his office there, has said that often players do not recognize, adopt, or support the discursive positions found within games, right? This isn't particularly new. Uh, and with the game's initial reception that I showed you before in mind, it's hardly surprising that a significant proportion of our paratexts uh, reject the game's very engagement with the climate crisis, right? But I, I, I want to argue that it is actually possible to read these paratexts, perhaps counterintuitively, as expressing a kind of ecological thought. And so according to Morton, there is a, a logic of a dark ecology that follows on from thinking ecologically, wherein the sort of ugly, messy, hidden substrates of ecological relations, including our own complicity in planetary destruction, become painfully apparent. Witnessing these dark undercurrents of ecology can evoke in us what Morton terms the shame. It's a violent thrashing whereby I try to rid myself of the stain of this complicity, right? So the climate crisis and its capacity to tear down the narratives of human harmony with Earth and endless accumulation and growth being like good things is nothing less than an assault on who we think we are, according to David Collings. Riven by the knowledge of human complicity and the great crime of ecological collapse, and confronted by the climate catastrophe's sort of anti-subjective challenges, it's a natural response, I think, to lash out with anger, rejection, and even, per Morton, a shameful laughter uh, that sort of masks our guilt and is an attempt to wipe away the evidence of one's own abjection. Morton uh, suggests that using ecological thinking to cross the boundary into the true darkness of ecological relations requires a recognition of trauma, an acknowledgement that we never wiped away the vomit, so to speak, and that we never could. Uh, and I suggest that maybe in these negational paratexts, uh, we see some gestures towards the possibility, I'm couching this in a lot of tentative language, uh, that some of their creators might be approaching that figurative discursive boundary into the darkness of ecology, uh, ecological thinking. Now, this is gonna be a seamless pivot from the gloominess of post-apocalyptic uh, player anger to the comparative idol of Animal Crossing New Horizons. Uh, hope the whiplash is treating you well. This is a life simulation game, I'm sure I don't need to tell you this, that draws players into the escapist fantasy of relocating to a deserted island and cultivating it into an idyllic paradise. Um, steeped in like this this charming cartoonish aesthetic and emphasizing a bucolic way of life new horizons appears to immerse its players in a virtual world predicated upon wholesome and ecologically conscious engagements with natural environments um, we pulled three exciting themes from our paratexts the first we've called producing nature and this is where players are at work creating nature as non-human by way of the image of a sublime landscape uh, lying separately from ourselves. We'll be unpacking that. Uh, the second is exploiting nature, where environment and ecology become an economic resource for exploitation and extraction. And the last one we've called mourning nature, and this theme captures player revelations of the ecological damage engendered by their relations with environments in the game. Uh, so I'm going to talk through just the first one, paratexts that reflect players engaged with the production of nature and its meaning. So players arrive on their deserted islands, uh, primed to undertake not only acts of construction, but also the kind of writing that Kyle Bohinicki identifies in the play of Minecraft. It's a combination of nature and technology that transforms environments into user-crafted texts, right? That's in a nutshell. And so in our artifacts that we've been studying, uh, players often embrace their role as builders, terraformers, uh, with a keen eye on the ultimate textuality of their islands, striving for a sense of coherence across the different construction decisions they take. So, Quick example, we have users who share advice about strategies for planning, drafting, and executing their island designs, right? And the desire 
a coherent and meaning-laden meaning -laden textuality in players' constructions usually centers around a core aesthetic premise. Players commonly seek advice about satisfying these different textual ambitions, looking to build islands that are characterized by sleek modernity or eco-friendliness. Uh, and overwhelmingly, players' thematic aspirations uh, invoke forms of nature or naturalness that are rustic and sometimes wild. So anyone who's played Animal Crossing and has gone onto the internet to see what other players are up to are probably used to posts like this. Uh, screenshots that illustrate nature-themed islands are enormously popular. So trees, flowers, waterfalls, cliffs, rolling meadows, and other environmental features dominate these paratexts. Other posts include advice sought on maximizing the appearance of fauna or attracting villagers whose underlying animal species are like more sympathetic to the um, wilderness environments that players are trying to construct. So armed with the capacity to write their islands, players end up repeating a common tendency in games, as Alinda reminds us, to construct cliched landscapes and pre-patterned and ultimately quite generic scenes that reflect an abstract, ever-receding pastoral ideal um, babbling brooks and neatly arranged woodlands, right? The paratexts also reveal another common ambition to represent human development as undertaken in harmony with surrounding nature. So the range of construction options and placeable objects available to players is, is huge in Animal Crossings, right? right? So islands are constrained spaces. It's quite hard, uh, it's quite a challenge for players to develop their islands significantly while retaining this much prized appearance of naturality. So we see, you know, from the specific, this is advice sought on how to integrate and conceal metallic pipes into the virtual landscape, or there are other posts where people want to like soften the transition from a forest to their house, and what objects can I place to kind of make this feel natural, uh, to sort of more abstracted expressions. So these screenshots are from a video walkthrough uh, where someone is showing off that their island is this seemingly overgrown environment where nature has overwhelmed human design. But of course it is all human design. Um, users detail approaches they have taken to terraforming their island landscapes without radically disrupting pre-existing natural features. Uh, imagining that there is a kind of underlying geography that has to provide an ongoing substrate uh, to constrain human development, even though this isn't the case in terms of the game system or its affordances. So within a uh, player's assembly of landscapes and material structures appears a deeply embedded orientation toward the construction of apparently natural, ecocentric and bucolic texts. This virtualized impulse mirrors a historical process, as Ari and Larson tell us, uh, where deliberate ways of visually forming idealized landscapes through cultivated eyes, skillful techniques, and technologies of representation has allowed humans to possess and control the natural world. Starting with medieval and early modern conceptions of Earth's natural world as being organized according to a divine hierarchy, um, and sort of reaffirmed in the Romantic era, uh, where nature, sort of verdant, unspoiled, sublime, was raised to like quasi-mythical status by poets and artists, our surrounding environments and their meaning have, have long been subject to human construction, right? So, uh, a culturally sort of situated dualism between nature and society is normalized through these idealized representations of ecologies. Uh, this imagined divide persists despite our experience of these natural worlds being actively constituted through non-natural processes, including the ways that many environments we consider unspoiled actually rely quite heavily upon human intervention to maintain. Uh, so, by continuing these long-running uh, traditions of constructing natures and idealized forms, uh, the players in our data seem uh, to embrace an assumed human mastery over nature and perpetuate what Ben calls uh, meta-narratives about the triumph of humanity over an untamed nature. And you could probably all guess where this was going, because nature 
when uncoupled from society through the fiction of its apparent non-humanity becomes dematerialized and it's rendered entirely open to capitalist exploitation uh, in the human imagination. This is what Jason Moore calls very compellingly the cheapening of nature and it reconfigures it as a docile standing reserve for us humans. Uh, nature is made conceptually readily available for consumption by the techniques of appropriation, production, and the accumulation of capital. Sorry to bring the mood down. Uh, so you can see this paratextual theme addressing the act of production of nature slides quite neatly into the next two uh, about the extent to which players actively put nature to work in the name of capital and its accumulation. But in another seamless transition, this is a thread we'll pick up with City Skylines. Um, standing in the city I'm standing in, I probably don't need to introduce this game at length. It's a city building and management game. It's developed right here, isn't it? Uh, it engages its players in the process of the transformation of untouched landscapes into bustling cities, right? And players are granted wide-ranging physical and legislative agency to achieve this. Um, so, combing through the paratexts from this, uh, this game's communities, we found ourselves with three central themes, and the names got a lot clunkier this time, but the first one was producing eco-aesthetics. This is where we saw players seek quite superficially ecocentric aesthetics in the design of their cities. Uh, entangling ecologies, where we saw player decisions, game system glitches, all sorts of things combine to help manifest phenomena such as climate change or ecological collapse. Uh, and then finally, players adopting cybernetic logics in their engagements with ecologies, and this is the one we will discuss. So, sorry, uh, we see here an impetus to adopt uh, cybernetic logics in engagements with ecologies within play. In using the term cybernetic, I'm referring to closed systems of processing uh, that address massively complex, dynamic, and contingent circumstances. These systems are characterized by the centrality of positive and negative feedback loops, uh, and they use findings from these loops to try to create a seamlessly functional system. Right, and the system is constantly adapting and discarding dysfunctional uh, like elements in its quest for optimal action. So against the, uh, the backdrop, I'm sure again I don't need to tell anyone this, the backdrop of the burgeoning dominance of algorithmic processing in contemporary culture, cybernetic phenomena already proliferate across many aspects of human life, encouraging in subjects, or in our case players, a sort of technical mentality that enmeshes nature and technology, materiality and thought, the individual and the community, and as Stephanie Wakefield has been telling us for years, also shapes and enables neoliberal governmentality. So, for the skylines, its uh, underlying simulation is detailed and sophisticated, right? It's built to model uh, the social, cultural, and economic activities of up to a million virtual system, uh, citizens. Sorry, uh, This underlying model provides players with countless feedback loops and systemic inputs that they must master to foster thriving cities. And the paratexts we studied illustrate an array of ways that players adapt their behaviours to constantly optimise their systemic, systemic inputs during play. So consider, for example, water treatment, just one example. We see numerous players discuss optimal plans for the combination of different bits of infrastructure to completely clean, recycle wastewater. Users compare with one another the statistics and measurements associated with each type of facility. They share experiments they've made, balancing cost efficiency and productivity. And they share moments of learning from stories of failure, like on the right, uh, where it's all gone wrong and sewerage has entered the drinking water supply and killed all the citizens. Um, so whether optimizing power generation, agricultural supply chains, the speed and natural resource extraction, the profitability 
of gated parks, uh, players appear deeply enmeshed in a pattern of cybernetic decision making designed to improve their engagement with the computational patterns of the game system as it relates to environments. You do not need to read the words on this, don't worry. <laughs> this, this cybernetic structure is further revealed when players demand richer opportunities for human agency within the game system. These paratexts commonly appear as text posts written in considerable detail. That's what we needed to take away from this screenshot. Requesting new features for the game, or just like lamenting the absence of them in the current game. In some cases, users want greater granularity in the simulation of their relationships with the virtual environments of the game. This might be just like adding a specific species of tree. Um, or new means to extract and harvest natural resources. This person wants open cast mines in city skylines. Um, or adjustments to the game at a more systemic level with the simulation of more dynamic natural conditions, sea level rise, things like that. Or representations of air pollution and the effects of climate change. Is it too much to ask for? So the impetus toward uh, cybernetic modes of thinking and action within city skylines represents, I think, another unlikely form of ecological thought. Uh, in as much as ecological thought demands that close attention be paid to interconnection and the long chains of cause and effects that make up the ecologies of our life worlds, cybernetic phenomena similarly speak to links, loops, inputs, outputs, complex systems, right? Uh, and so this, I think, is an abjected form of ecological thought, one that actually works in service of the human environmental relations both desired and propagated by the Anthropocene, rather than the more radical possibility that Morton imagines of ecological thinking provoking revelations about these countless layers of entanglement and concomitants that make up everyday life. And my suggestion that players might be uh, caught up in such a perversion of ecological thought also brings us back to the central position of our old friend industrial capital and its exploitative environmental values. As Jason Moore argues, capitalism must be considered as a situated and multi-species world ecology of capital, power and reproduction. Uh, with capital entirely subsuming the ecology we have tended to associate with nature in its process of colonizing the multi-layered relations of our lives. Uh, in appreciating that the ecologies that surround us, as well as the very concept of ecology, are permeated by the impulses of capitalism, then I think it's no great leap to think of ecological thought as also being prone to similar objection. So, whirlwind tour, but hopefully uh, like a useful greatest hits package. Uh, I've drawn attention here, hopefully, to how mainstream video games might prompt players to exhibit forms of ecological thought or towards emergent engagements with ecologies. Uh, I think we also see that there is no easy escape from the assemblage of technics, governance, and capital that characterizes the Anthropocene. And so, by way of wrapping up, I'll take a sip of water before this. I think that the, um, the diversity and the richness of player paratextual activity across these games gives lie to any suggestion that there can be a simple, singular or fixed uh, ecological dynamic associated with individual games. Rather, thinking ecologically allows for individual and collective responses to ecologies and games that are as divergent, fluid, heterogeneous as that ecological mesh uh, itself that Morton tries to unveil. And because ecological thought is characterized by how we think rather than what we're thinking about, it's a concept that allows us to move, I think, beyond the reductive binaries of like agreeing with or disagreeing with climate change discourse, for example. Ecological thought centers on the revelation, at times gradual, at other times rapid and overwhelming, of coexistence and interconnection. And as this kind of growing awareness can suffuse countless moments of thought, interaction, and play, there are like near endless opportunities uh, to reorient oneself gradually, suddenly, radically, subtly towards ecological relations and uh, conditions. And approaches 
that have been popular among game studies at different times that privilege the idea that either game mechanics or high fidelity simulations might work persuasively to shift player attitudes on ideological matters appear really unhelpful, I think, in the context of eco-critical inquiry. So I agree with Ben on this quite, quite clearly. By turning our attention to ecological thought in the manifold ways that players are engaged in its emergence, I think we can begin to better account for the complex assemblages of ecological awareness that exist in the inner lives of players and also collectively in their play communities. So paratexts and the communities in which they are shared, hopefully have shown, uh, offer a kind of a point of entry to uncover what is otherwise hidden or obscured or contingent and unpredictable in the player game relationship and indeed the player ecology or game ecology relationships. These complicated, contradictory and emergent discursive patterns challenge presumptions that might be made about you know, quite singular player readings of or persuasion by games which incorporate ecological characteristics. And at a time when renewed attention is being paid to the material origins of digital media in terms of planetary resources, energy and waste, player paratexts also help us uncover the porosity between uh, both our lived material conditions and the digital game objects we play. And so, also, these games and their players, I hope these paratexts have gone some way to show, uh, echo and refract and negotiate the ecological dynamics and futures that undergird contemporary life in the Anthropocene, and they remind us of the entanglement of play with the circuits of contemporary power and political and economic conditions. And then, uh, just in case my employer is watching, yay, they paid for it. Um, you're not going to read that. Thank you so much for listening. Great stuff, mate. All right, uh, we've got 15 minutes for questions now. Um, Larry's not a snob, so they don't have to be carefully composed. He's come a long way for them, so just uh, you know, please feel like you can ask him a question about his work. Okay, Miko, I'm just going to walk this over to you. So we aren't taught how to throw things forward in New Zealand. <laughs> That's a rugby joke. I thank you for the presentation. Really fascinating stuff. Uh, what I was I was left thinking is. Uh, it's it's uh, as you mentioned. It's pretty. It's a pretty heavy subject to look into. Uh, like personally, did or and or has this research kind of has left you more sort of like even more depressed or or has there like or is there kind of like any any glimmer of hope in the kind of like the data that you've looked into? And it's like it's like the question I don't want to answer because <laughs> yeah, it doesn't get any better <laughs> the further the further in you get and the more you start thinking. Uh, like a kind of a flip side to that question that I was asked last week was, do you see players sort of reflecting on acknowledging the, the materiality of play and maybe themselves thinking, and the answer was no. And like, that's the thing I think that starts to uh, worry me that, you know, that reflexivity, at least in the communities we were looking at, isn't there. So while you can read all the environmental humanities in the world and just get like more and more depressed about where we're heading, then you're like, oh, maybe there'll be something really encouraging when I actually go look at what's happening in, in like these discursive spaces. And then you go, oh no, oh no. And like for anyone, I guess, who's researched ideologies or like political politicality in games, like this is probably a similar sensation, I'm sure. Uh, so short answer, no. <laughs> And that's also, I guess, spoken to someone who lives in a little country in the corner of the planet that's feeling the effects of climate crisis more and more every year, as you are here in Europe, as having a 23 degree day in Warsaw four days ago blew my mind, like it's October, what's happening? Yeah. So that was a great question to start, start us <laughs> off with, eh? Yeah, thank you so much. Maybe I should say thank you for your honesty. Yeah. <laughs> All right, Casey. 
that was a great talk. Plugs right, into a lot of stuff that uh, I've uh, been thinking about too. So I really appreciate the timeliness of it. Um, there's a 2021 Nature article uh, about affective polarization, uh, and it might be helpful to kind of understand this. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. It's not going to make you feel any better. No. <laughs> uh, uh, because it's it's quite broken, um, and some of the subsequent research that came after it. Uh, the only way to solve it is to pay people. They actually know the real info. They they know what's happening. Yeah. Like, yeah. And convince them that their friends won't know that they think climate change is real. And yeah. if you're like, here's a twenty dollar bill, they're like, yeah, I know climate change is I'll real. Like, yeah, yeah. It's horrible. Anyway, uh, so to my uh, question, um, uh, and you don't have to have an answer because I don't think I I don't know if I do either. Uh, uh, so if games can't save us. Uh, okay. thoughts on what might yeah and so also i will just rest on the affect thing for a second because that sounds like a really useful um recommendation because i've been thinking about and Oscar and i almost touched on this and then we realized we had to come here because it was 10 too um but i've been thinking about apocalyptic affect a lot it's like a thing that just seems to be surrounding us and permeating so much of 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 our kind of relations at the moment so i've i've not arrived there with this project but i'm like affect has to be a key way to explain different modes of play over it just everything just seems to be grounded in, in affect ultimately so thank you casey mm -hmm. uh what will save us i don't know if laura's on the stream but we had a beer the other night and <laughs> we kind of circled around this question several times and both arrived at well it's really only direct action at this point right i think the the kind of how to blow up a pipeline sort of approach to things increasingly seems like the only way that the generations below us at least can maybe make a final stand and protect what the generations ahead of us have have ruined for everyone I don't, yeah, so there's, I can get really honest on this answer. Uh, so, for example, Ben Abraham, who I quote extensively, he left academia because this isn't maybe the space to fix these problems. And his, if you've read his most recent book, which is incredible, Digital Games After Climate Change, you know, his, his conclusion is that we need to stop sitting around thinking about it. We need to stop worrying as that quote I had says uh, about whether we can change players minds and persuade and actually we just need to decarbonize the hell out of this industry as quickly as possible because that's what we need to do in every single industry as quickly as possible so I often sit there going what am I doing like, <laughs> then I'm also like this is the only skill set I have so you know I guess we all contribute in our own way to developing some hopefully rising tide of consciousness and desire for a for whether it's action or, or thinking around change. But I guess my short answer is every year we get further into this, I just think it can only really be direct action that radically turns the dial on this. I mean, maybe you had a question. Um, so yeah, if that, God, yep. can someone ask a cheerful question? <laughs> <laughs> Ah, oh, ask her or give us, yeah, yeah. So, yeah. Th this will cheer you up, Larry. Like, we're preventing people from playing FIFA right now. Oh, yeah. <laughs> the, the, the carbon footprint of this room has dropped dramatically in the last 45 minutes, yeah. Um, so, yeah, first of all, thank you. Thank you for the presentation. Um, I'm very sorry because I'm dropping from not being cheerful even lower. Um, <laughs> maybe because when looking at the sources you, you presented now, or the, the three three um, cases, we still see games which either are very close to the current reality in their mm. like, aesthetic representation, or we see games as, let's say, for example, um, City Skylines, which propose that there is a way of building a sustainable city or the, the cottage core fantasy of Animal Crossing of like, ah, there is, even though it's a weirdly highly mm. capitalistic society, it still can be this nice little utopia. Um, what, and then Battlefield, I don't know, maybe still there is a bit of this weird savior moment, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. hero journey, whatever the hell is going on there. Um, 
What I'm wondering a bit is where would you locate the narrative of the post-cataclysmic and the idea that we especially see within quite a lot of environmental theory of the whole idea of how to change things or the possibility of changing mm. things is basically we are way too late for that. So it's basically just we're heading towards the end. We're heading very fast towards the end. The only thing we can do is like making a little bit more of time. Yeah. So um, do you already recognize within the research like some difference also in the in the paratexts uh, produced or is there some yeah. some take of yours on, on the appearance of that specific approach? Yeah, that's a really good question. For a little while, I was worried you were like a closet accelerationist and you were like, Oh, I'm going to burn it all down today. God, no. No, 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 no. <laughs> uh, but, but there was like a nice save at the end of the question. Uh, yeah, so I think you've identified like a clear bias in the case studies. So we deliberately went for like super mainstream, super popular, big games. Uh, whereas, of course, there are lots of experimental games, art games, lots of wonderful indie projects that do position us in very unfamiliar um not, even, not just unfamiliar worlds, but I guess like unfamiliar spatial relations, temporal relations, and I think these things are super important. Um, and, you know, if you think about the post-humanists, who I know you do think about, or people like Haraway, like those forms of estrangement are really important to, to pushing our thinking forward. But yeah, the case studies we have obviously don't do that work. Uh, but in terms of what's within the paratext, so one of our other case studies was Death Stranding, which of course, like we all know that Kojima is super engaged in thinking about climate crisis, and that game is almost a statement of sorts from him. That was a game where, and so we haven't finished the analysis on these paratexts, which is why I did not include them here, but um, we do see some like super interesting examples from players in those paratexts saying, well, like this is our world after it all ends like they they really do identify with that mission that sam bridges has of like um i know it's like this utopian vision of the power of technology and communications to to fix us all again and to write what's wrong in all our political discourse and everything so you see play and then, and then it gets quite complex because you see players going yeah, this game is totally where we are in 20 years and we need to gear up for our missions to <laughs> climb across the mountains and fix everything. But then you also see players go, well, no, actually, ultimately, the game is just asking me to restage what went before. Like, this is the pattern of, of human hubris that leads us here. So, so from our case studies, not like super useful examples of that estrangement or that like thinking beyond to the post-Anthropocene, but... Um, like certainly something we want to get to in some future iteration, because as you know, the apocalypse is like my central interest. So yeah, thanks for a Thank very you. good question. <laughs> no one? Oh, Yako's got a question. Great. Thanks, buddy. Thank you for a super interesting talk. Um, um, do, 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 uh, what does the concept of paratext give us here? Uh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> that, that, that's the part I'm, I'm not fully following. Yeah, and I think for us it started as, I suppose, quite an instrumental concept. This is a thing that gives us access to emergent play experiences. And then I suppose, like, once you've gone through that door, you don't need the concept of the paratext because you've accessed those experiences. I know that um, like this is obviously a bit of a live debate at the moment. There's a really good piece by um, Yaroslav in Game Studies last year, beginning of this year, about paratext duality is something we should... Be sure was it Jan? Oh, was it Jan? Sorry. Even as I said it, I was like, got this one the wrong way around. Um, Man, three weeks in Europe, you think I'd be up on it by now. Uh, anyway, thinking about paratextuality is like a function rather than a kind of description of an object or an artifact. And I've become attracted by that, but I'm not 
I'm not there yet because I'm still, I guess, yeah, this, this very instrumental approach to them as how do we capture emergent gameplay experiences? Well, here's one thing that captures a slice in time of a way a player engaged and helps us lay bare all of those ecological dynamics. So what am I saying? I'm saying the paratext matters, but it also doesn't matter. Is that, or is that just yeah. like a New Zealand answer that, <laughs> that doesn't fly in the intellectually rigorous uh, climate of, of Finland? Um, you haven't quoted Janae. I know. I literally I deleted my Janae slide. <laughs> So I was like, we don't need to revisit 1992 again. Um, but yeah, so this is kind of something where, like with what I was saying about affect before is probably like our next urgent question, but we are kind of sitting there going, yeah, the paratechs have helped us this far, but I don't think they continue to be the be all and end all for what we want to think about. So that's a very good question. Yeah, we're all very good at finding the holes in what we've... Uh, <laughs> yeah. Mika's going to cheer us up. <laughs> All right, well, we've got like three minutes left for a question. Miko's like in the queue, but if if a student or guest was here, oh hey, congratulations! Thank you. It's just very quickly. I, I was wondering because following up on what Yako said, like you know, I was thinking in depth interviews or like uh, maybe an author, auto ethnographic yeah. work by someone like who's you know who knows as much as you do, playing one of those games and seeing what it does uh, to you. Have you considered like or, or yeah. that, is there work out there that does that? Um... I hadn't thought about the auto ethnographic angle, which is like a major oversight because. In the environmental humanities more broadly, autoethnographic work is actually like super common, especially like indigenous scholars, people in, you know, developing countries that are being completely fucked over by climate change. You know, these have become really powerful scholarly accounts of like the lived, the affect of the cultural experience of the Anthropocene. So yeah, I hadn't thought about that in relation to games. So that's a really good idea. And then, yeah, I suppose the more like social science-y interviews and all of that kind of stuff would be super valuable. It's just not the kind of, it's not the kind of thing I get excited by doing. <laughs> it's just like, oh shit, you're losing the room. Uh, <laughs> I love reading it. I just don't like doing it. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> it's humble to think that someone was, you know, want to know what you thought about something based on your own experience. But, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Please listen. Uh, <laughs> but the auto ethnographic, sorry, just to go back to it, that would be really cool because you could really unpick the phenomenological experience of play alongside those ecological qualities, alongside the affect of bit. Like it would be like a cool little nexus of things happening. Yeah, cheerful note to end on. How good. Hey, so we're going to wrap it up now. Yeah, um, Larry's got so many important things to do while he's in Finland. Thanks very much, um, Dr. May. Thank you, Tom.